It was in the early hours of June 28, 1969, that the entirety of the queer rights movement changed. It was this morning that the New York City Police, the Public Moral Squad, decided to raid the Stonewall Inn, a gay bar located in Greenwich Village. The raid sparked a riot among the patrons, employees, and others who just lived in the village. As police attempted to use physical force to haul employees and patrons out of the bar. The aftermath of that morning led to a multiple day protest made of violent fighting between police and queer people who had simply had enough. The riot served as a catalyst, a shift in the queer rights movement, leading us away from the homophile movement and into the queer liberation movement, which is also known as the modern gay rights movement in America. While this is one of the most famous events in queer history, and one of the only ones discussed in my AP U.S. History textbook from high school, it's been whitewashed. Like so much of American history, we've forgotten the people whose actions rang out that night, simply because of their race. We learned that it was the night that gay people had had enough, but in reality, Stonewall happened because of black and brown, trans and queer people who had had enough and decided to fight back against the intense brutality from police. We forget people like Marsha P. Johnson, a black trans woman who was a drag performer and a sex worker. And while there are many stories, myths, and legends surrounding what happened on that early morning, Marsha P. Johnson was definitely there. The P in her name stood for Pay It No Mind, which she would tell people when they were getting a little too nosy. But it seemed like the world took that advice, as she receives far less attention than she deserves. So during this episode, airing just a few days before the 51st anniversary of Stonewall, I want to tell a story about what happened. But I want to tell it through Marsha P. Johnson's story. Because it's about time we pay her our mind. I'm Alexis Arrington, and this is Everyone's Gay, A Look Into Queer History. Johnson was born in 1945 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. From a young age, she recognized that there was something different about her than the other kids around her. She began wearing a dress at the age of five, but was forced to stop because she was being teased too much. As soon as she graduated from high school, she went to New York with only a bag of clothes, $15, and a need to find a community where she could be accept accepted. Once in New York, she found Greenwich Village, one of the most tolerant places for LGBTQ plus people at the time. Greenwich Village had become a bohemian scene during the 1950s, when people who were part of many different groups and who had many different identities fled to this area, away from the oppressive social conformity that they saw in the rest of the world and the rest of New York. By the time Marsha P. Johnson had come to Greenwich Village, it had become a loose collection of writers, poets, artists, students, LGBTQ people, and others. But while Greenwich Village was one of the most tolerant places, police frequently harassed anyone who did not conform with sexual norms. There was no way that someone like Johnson, a black trans woman, could get or keep a job. So most of her life was spent homeless while working as a prostitute, a common way that queer people during this time made money. But despite the hard circumstances, Johnson was known for her personality, as she dressed in flashy homemade outfits with flowers, fruit, and even Christmas lights threaded throughout her hair. The bars and clubs in New York at this time that catered to the queer community were actually run and owned by the mafia, because while homosexuality was legal in the state of New York in the 1960s, Establishments openly serving alcohol to gay customers was considered disorderly, 
by the State Liquor Authority, and they refused to issue liquor license to many gay bars. And the businesses that remain open, serving queer people alcohol, were frequently raided by police. But the Mafia, which already had a strong presence in New York City at the time, saw a business opportunity in catering to the queer community. Here was an entire community of people who just wanted to drink, party, and dance with one another. So by the mid-1960s, the Genovese crime family controlled the majority of gay bars in the village, including the Stonewall Inn, and they bribed the police with around $1,200 a month to turn a blind eye to whatever was going on inside the establishments. And when the police did decide to raid the bars, they had a habit of tipping off the management so that they would know what was happening. But you know what? That's not what happened on the morning of June 28, 1969 when the police raided the Stonewall Inn. They busted in, armed with warrants, and they roughed up patrons, arresting 13 people, including employees and people violating the state's gender-appropriate clothing statute at the time. That statute said that people had to wear the clothes that matched the gender they were born with. So officers would commonly take suspected cross-dressing patrons into the bathroom to check their sex. But this time, the raid did not go as planned. The, set, the standard procedure was to line up patrons, check their identification, and arrest any cross-dressers. But this time, those dressed in women's clothing refused to go into the bathrooms, and the men in line refused to show their IDs. It is recalled by both patrons and police that there was a sense of discomfort quickly spreading throughout the room, as if they knew something huge was about to happen. Instead of dispersing, which was typical after a bar had been raided, the patrons lingered outside while police made arrests inside. Then a small scuffle broke out when a woman in handcuffs was escorted out of the bar. She escaped repeatedly and fought the police, swearing and shouting for about 10 minutes. While accounts of who this woman was exactly vary, it has been said that she was Stormy De La Vere, a butch biracial lesbian. She sparked a fight, as she looked directly at a bystander and shouted, why don't you guys do something? And fed up with the constant harassment, abuse, and social discrimination, those angry queer patrons and others from the neighborhood who had heard the commotion began to do something. The crowd began trying to flip over police cars, smashing tires, and began throwing coins at the police, a reference to how they were paid off by the mafia. Outnumbered, the police and a reporter from the Village Voice were trapped in the bar. And as they were trapped in there, angry queer people began hurtling garbage cans, rocks, bottles, bricks at the building. Now most accounts won't specify who was doing the throwing, but witnesses attest that the most outcast people in the gay community, flame queens, hustlers, and gay street kids, were the ones responsible for those first throws, as well as uprooting a parking meter that was used as a battering ram against the doors. They also lit garbage on fire and stuffed it in through the broken windows. The tactical police force, the New York City Police Department, arrived to free the police trapped inside the Stonewall Inn. Eventually the fire was put out and the police officers and the reporter inside were able to escape. But at this point, the crowd ranged into the thousands. When the police tried to block them in, they ran around the block, catching the police off guard from behind and basically trapping them again. The stories from that first night of rioting range depending on the witnesses you talk to. But the common theme is that it was violent. Police beat rioters, windows were smashed, police cars and buildings set on fire. But eventually the crowd did disperse, leaving behind a sea of debris in the street. But the story doesn't end there. As leaflets were passed out the next day, talking about what had happened and urging people to fight against the injustice. The next night, the Stonewall Inn opened back up. Then the riots continued. And more people showed up. There were people from the anti-war movement and the Black Panthers. It didn't matter if they were queer or straight. It mattered that they were fighting the abusive police power. The next night was even more violent than the first. Police hit rioters with batons, smashing people's heads and leaving them bleeding on the street. But people kept showing up. And even though there had been riots before, what made this one different 
is that people kept showing up for several days after the initial fight. The question of who threw the first brick at Stonewall is important because it calls attention to those who started the movement. While many say it's Marsha P. Johnson, she later denied this saying she had arrived after they had already begun fighting. Others say it was Sylvia Rivera, a Latina transgender woman who was a friend of Johnson's. Others say it was Stormy. But no matter who threw that first brick, it's important to remember that it was most likely thrown by a person of color and most likely a trans person of color. But the story that is constantly fed to the general public is that white gay men joining into a kick line, singing about being Nelly Queens, those were the ones that threw the first bricks. And while they were there and they did get into a kick line and sing about being Nelly Queens, they weren't the ones that threw this first brick. And that's important because it's important to recognize who started the riots. It wasn't these men, it was black and brown trans and queer people who were simply fed up of being harassed by white cops. You may notice that a lot of the video coverage from that night, including what I was just showing, and the pictures that were made famous, profiled white protesters. Many documentaries or news stories that you see have white protesters interviewed. But Stonewall was started by people of color specifically trans women and drag queens. And that is why learning about people such as Marsha P. Johnson is so important to the queer rights movement. As there would simply be no gay liberation movement without black trans people. After Stonewall, Johnson continued fighting against injustices. Her most notable direct action occurred in August of 1970, when she staged a sit-in at NYU after administrators had canceled a dance when they found out it was sponsored by gay organizations. Shortly after, Johnson and Sylvia Rivera co-founded the Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR. And we will talk about this more in an episode on Sylvia Rivera in a few weeks. She continued fighting against transphobia and oppression from police, and also the gay liberation movement, as in 1973, though Johnson and Rivera were two powerhouse queer icons, they were banned from participating in the gay pride parade that year. Now keep in mind, pride honors Stonewall. But the organization claimed that they weren't going to allow drag queens in the parade as it was giving the community a bad name. This is just one example of how the gay rights movement itself had tried to censor the voices of black and brown trans women. But Johnson fought this. Her and Sylvia Rivera and other black trans women and drag queens decided to walk in front of the parade. And when they were asked why they were doing this, Johnson shouted, Darling, I want my gay rights now. I think it's about time the gay rights have been to got their rights. And especially the women. <laughs> In 1992, Marsha P. Johnson's body was discovered floating in the Hudson River. Police initially ruled the death a suicide, but Johnson's friends and the community she had built insisted that it could not be so, noting that there had been a large head wound on Johnson's body. In 2012, the New York Police Department reopened the case as a possible homicide after pressure from activists, but the police just reclassified Johnson's case from suicide to undetermined. Activists are still working to figure out what exactly happened the night Johnson died, but as of right now, we still have no answers. To learn more about Marsha P. Johnson and the events of Stonewall, I recommend these titles. The 2012 documentary, Pay It No Mind, The Life and Times of Marsha P. Johnson, heavily features the segments from a 1992 interview with Johnson, which was filmed shortly before her death. Many friends of Johnson's from Greenwich Village are interviewed in this documentary. Marsha also appears as a character in two dramatized movies based on the events of Stonewall. First, Stonewall, 2015, and Happy Birthday, Marsha, 2016. The 2017 documentary, The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, is another great resource. It follows trans woman Victoria Cruz of the Anti-Violence Project as she investigates Johnson's murder. Like Pay It No Mind, it relies on archival footage and interviews. 
In the next episode, we will continue this conversation on Stonewall, looking at how the first Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade, which is now known as Pride, came to be. But as we come upon the 51st anniversary of Stonewall, we are also seeing the first year since the uprising that the Pride Parades have not occurred. It is also a time when we are seeing a huge social movement to change the narrative of our history. To remember what actually happened and who actually made change versus the whitewashed story we've been telling ourselves. So on Sunday, the 51st anniversary, remember why we celebrate. Remember the lives of Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and Stormy De Levine and other unnamed black and brown trans and queer people who were instrumental in starting the modern queer rights movement. I'm Lexis Arrington, and this has been Everyone's Gay, a look into queer history. If you like this video, make sure to hit like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Also, find us on social media at facebook.com slash everyone's gay queer history or on Instagram at everyone's gay queer history. Again, I'm Alexis Harrington. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Happy Pride.